And one of the things that I really discovered early in my life, my dad would kind of beat this over into my head, was the power of compound interest. So, you know, you've got 2.5 million that's earning 18% and you don't have to ever pay taxes again and it compounds at that rate. That's, that's the holy grail right there. You're listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their current portfolio allocation. Now to your hosts, Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson. Alrighty, welcome back, everybody. Another episode of the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast, episode 247 here. Crazy, it's been almost 250 millionaires. Jace, how are you? Doing great, man. It's uh, it's uh, quite quite the milestone we're coming up on. Uh, excited for it, though, yeah. How are you doing, man? Good, good. Doing well, yeah. It's, I guess we had a few guests in, in there, but yeah, almost 250 millionaires, so pretty wild. We had somebody write in this week. This is from Joe. Uh, I'll just read his email. Hey, guys, love the show. I'm curious if any of your millionaires have used crowdfunded real estate. He lists Fundrise, CrowdStreet as a couple examples, as a means to build wealth. I am interested in adding real estate to my portfolio, but I'm not interested in owning, maintaining physical real estate myself. Thanks for my thanks for considering my question, Joe. What's your take, Jace? If we, I can think of a couple millionaires that have used this, and I don't believe anybody's put significant amounts of money into these platforms. But do you remember any specifically? I don't. I don't remember any specifically. But I'm like you. I, I recall a couple that that I know that we've discussed it with. Uh, but like you said, I don't think it's been a lot of money that that they've put in. You know, some of those platforms you're investing, you know, on a on a deal by deal basis. In some cases, you're investing in a couple different deals, so there's still a little bit of you know work, I guess, involved in terms of underwriting. It's not as easy as potentially you know buying an S and P. It's not like a real estate index fund or a REIT that you might get you know in the public markets. Uh, but, you know, I think there's there's opportunities out there for sure. I mean, we've, you know, Clark and I invest in real estate and we know lots of people that do. Uh, but those those are probably not the most common ways we see people invest in real estate. You know, obviously, we only think of a, of a couple. But, you know, I don't personally, I don't have anything wrong with or see anything wrong with them. I just haven't used them myself. I've looked into them, but I've never I've never made any investments on any of those crowdfunded platforms. Yeah, but I guess, the, yeah, yeah, certainly. And to answer the question, uh, they do use it, but we have not seen that very often. Um, but definitely have seen it on the show. So there are some people who do it. So fun interview this week with TJ, net worth of $9.5 million. He's in his 50s, a couple of businesses in the environmental, environmental and lending space. So a little bit more of a unique and different interview than we've had on, on the show. Uh, this last week we had Amber, net worth of about 1.1, owns a commercial cleaning franchise business and has an interesting story about how she got involved in small business, which initially started uh, with her taking over one of her family's business and all the sacrifices that she made now to get to where she was. So fun to hear about a franchise business owner and a small business owner uh, also you know, bringing a different feel to the show. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And without any further delay, let's get into this week's interview with TJ. TJ, do you want to just give us a little bit about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah. So what I do now is I I own three different companies. I own two environmental companies and I own a hard money lending business. Um, Prior to that, I was in the restaurant business. I had uh, two of my own restaurants and failed miserably. And prior to that, I was an executive in um, two different restaurant chains. Dang. I mean, that's pretty loaded in, in terms of the history. And we'll get into some of the details there. So what is your net worth today? About um, uh, not about 9.5 million. And how is that divided up? Well, it's, it's, a, it's pretty, it's kind of a little bit complicated. So I have a, I have about 4.2 million in retirement accounts. And I have, so of that 4.2, Two million and change. I have about two point five million in Roth IRA loans. So I have three entities that lend that, that I lend money out of my Roth IRAs. We can talk, you know, why we can talk more about that later. And I have then I have three hundred thousand in another Roth four hundred one k. And then I have one almost one point five million in a four hundred one k. Those two are managed by some financial advisors. And then I have a health savings account of. You know, with uh, like thirty four thousand in that, 
So that adds up to about four point, a little bit over four point two million. And then in my non-retirement accounts, I have one point two million in a brokerage account. I have about two point eight million, two point nine million in loans that I lent that I have uh, that I lend out. And I own two company, two uh, the two environmental companies. One has a net worth of one point eight million, and that's using you know four times trailing two years of cash flow. And then another one's worth about five hundred and thirty thousand using the same four times trailing two years of cash flow. And I've got a, some some lines of credit debt of about one point two million. So that kind of nets out at right around nine point five. Okay, man, this is going to be super interesting. How how much do you roughly between businesses, personal, do you allocate towards cash? I know you mentioned some of these loans, and we'll get into some of that. But how much, you know, just in general, conceptually, do you try to keep it in liquid cash? Um, I don't keep a ton of cash because I have two. So one of the advantages of the business is it's very um, cash flow oriented. So money comes through my accounts. You know, you know, I've, we're doing about four million in revenue. So the, between the three businesses, so that money comes in every month. So I don't feel the need to keep a lot of cash on hand because I can always take that money if I need to. I also have um, two pretty substantial lines of credit that I can pull off of. So I always, I mean, at any given time, I usually have a million to a million and a half in cash, but some of that cash is allocated towards loans that are going to be closing in the future. So it's it's not it's just not a simple question to ask, but I always have lots of cash hanging around as a rule of thumb, whether I want to or not. Totally, totally. And do you have any home equity? Yeah. So I have. A, I have. You mean, you mean equity in my home? Yeah. Or do you, do you own a home first of all? I guess, and then yeah, do you have some equity in yes. the home as well? Yeah, so I, I own a home and I, I paid off the mortgage on it a long time ago and, and put on a home equity line, a large home equity line of credit as a first lien, which allows me to just take money out as I need it and then pay it back as I need it. You know, if, if I have a surplus of cash in the lending business, I'll pay down that line to nothing. And if I need the money, I can pull out almost almost 600000 off that line. Okay, interesting. When did you decide to pay off the home and then put in place that HELOC? Oh, that was probably about seven years ago. I just, I wanted the flat, even though I'm probably at some level screwing myself by having, you know, even though the interest rate on that is very low right now, it'll go high as interest rates go up. I could lock in a 30 year fix at, you know, 2.8 or something. I just love the flexibility of being able to pay it down, take it off, pay it down. I do that several times a week. Any spare cash I have, I just pay down the line. I'm, I'm basically getting like 3% of my spare cash by paying down the line, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So uh, let's just walk through this a little bit because this is pretty interesting. So you essentially are using that that home equity line of credit much like any business would use an asset-backed line of credit for, for some assets that they have where you are fluxing on that line weekly, basically. Is that correct? Yes. And then I... I also have a line on my brokerage account. No, so it's not a margin loan. It's a it's a line of credit using it's a line of credit with a financial institution that uses the brokerage account as collateral. And so I can t- you know I have that 1.2 million I have in that brokerage account. I can take out about 62% of that in a line of credit. So that's my secondary line of credit that I use when needed. Interesting. So when did you set that up? About two, two and a half years ago. Okay. And then you also have a similar function with your retirement accounts. Is that correct with the, with the loans there? So in the Roth IRAs, I have, you know, I guess they call them checkbook LLC, you know, checkbook LLCs. So the, the IRAs, my wife's and my IRAs own three different companies that lend out money. They don't have lines. They don't have lines of credit on them. There's no borrowed money inside of them. So they do make loans, hard money loans, which we, we can talk about whenever you're ready, but they just make, they just lend money to investors. Yeah, let's jump into it now, TJ. So t- the hard money lending, I mean, what what's your rates? How do you do it? How do you find people? Who do you lend to? So I, I lend money anywhere. I have two different programs, but I lend money anywhere from 14 to 16% and four to six points. Wow, so it's, which is high. It's high. And I have a, and I have 170 loans out there. Like, like it's not like I, I have a tremendous demand for the money. You're saying you do have a tremendous demand. Right. I have a yeah, I have about 
about 11 million on the street. Now, some of that's borrowed. I, I borrow money inside my lending company, my, my main lending company. So I have the, I have the, the Roth IRA lending companies and I have my main lending company and I borrow a fair amount of money from investors to, you know, I borrow at like, you know, between six and 8% and then lend it out at, you know, an average of 15 and five. So you're 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 taking a hard money loan from somebody at eight and what eight and two and then lending it out at fifteen and five. I wouldn't call it a hard money loan. I would you know if you want to be real re- rigorous, I would call it just a loan. So some people lend me money at eight percent, anywhere between six and eight percent, and then and then I lend it back out at an average of fifteen and five. And uh, and currently you said you have one hundred and forty something, one hundred and forty four loans out. One hundred and seventy. 170. What's the value range from? Well, so a, a certain portion of my loans pay down because they're amortizing loans. About half my money is in in, in, amort- in five year amortized loans, and the other half is in you know twelve month interest only loans where people are flipping houses. So I might when I originate the loans, I probably average. I go down as low as you know eighteen thousand, all the way up to three hundred thousand. I probably average about eighty thousand because I have a whole ton of twenty five, thirty, thirty five thousand self amortizing loans, then a whole bunch of eighty to one hundred and fifty to one hundred and eighty thousand dollar you know quote flip loans you know, that are going to be sold to first time home buyers. To answer your question, you know some of those self amortized loans. You know I have some loans right now with eight hundred dollars left on them because they start at forty thousand. There's two payments left, so it's a, it's kind of a complicated yeah, answer yeah. to your question. No, no, it's interesting. So, so one of the pay, one of the loans is going to people that are buying a home, and and from our previous conversation, it's a home that they can't get financing on primarily because the value is low. Is that correct? No. So, so I only lend money to investors. Okay. So. So these are loans, those loans are actually like rental properties where the investors buy buying a rental property, you know, for anything from twenty to sixty thousand dollars. I'm financing them, they're renting it out and paying me back over five years. And they're really making more than sixteen and six or fifteen and five or whatever on that property? Yeah, these are these are, you know, properties that are, you know, in the lower quality areas of large a you know, a large city. And you know they might buy a house for twenty five to thirty five thousand. If they buy a house for twenty five, which is very doable, or they buy it for thirty and they might put five grand of their own money down, then they're going to rent it out for say a thousand bucks a month. They're going to pay me six oh eight a month, which is interest plus principal on twenty five thousand. So the idea is that they kind of break even for five years. Then they own the property free and clear. Gotcha. So they're building equity is how they might be looking at it. Right, exactly. And then the other loans are to people that are flipping properties. Right. So to you know investor, you know, all those people like on flip or flop or flip this house. You know, I'm kind of like the guy behind the scenes lending the money to do the rehab. They buy it at auction, they buy it at a foreclosure, they buy an REO, you know, just some kind of distressed property. I, I would fund the purchase price, I fund the the rehab money, then they put it back on the market, sell it, pay me off, and do the next one. So how do these people find you? Is it all word of mouth now? Is it primarily to the same investors? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of amazing. I don't know about the same investors. I you know, there's a fine there's what you'd call a financing curve. You know, at fifteen and five, people try to not use me as much as they can, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <For sure. laughs> so as they get their cash or they or they might find their own private lenders that might lend them, you know, friends and family, 8%, you know, in one or 10 and zero. So I do a lot of work with, um, so I do, so people might come in and out. They might use me for five or six loans, get really good at what they're doing, find a cheaper source of financing, and then I'll take on the next group of people. Or, and sometimes people stay with me. Sometimes they have credit problems. You know, they, they might have bad credit, but they're just good, solid people. They might be immigrants. Um, they don't speak English. So they, they just they don't work well inside the financial system or even with investors. So that's the market I serve. They, they've, they're, you know, banks will not finance properties that don't that aren't livable. So most of the properties that are being bought have some level of distress to them. And that's how they're adding value by fixing them up, making them worth more, whether it be to flip them to a homeowner or just to get them rent ready to 
you know, so that a, a landlord can rent them out and make their money that way. Sure. So all your loans, they're collateralized by the property. You're in first position. Is yeah, that right? 100% first liens on all my properties. So the people then that are lending the hard money to you, do they have anything put up on that? I wouldn't say it's hard money. Uh, I mean, if you want to just... Or a personal you know, loan. I mean... Yeah, it's yeah. more like... You could say they're investors, but they're really not because they don't have a piece of the business. They're just lending money to me, and I it, it it's pooled, so it comes into the company, and then I just pay them eight percent. Whether it be sometimes they let it compound, and sometimes they want it every month. I just pay it out every month, so they just it's just a straight promissory note. And then if they have over a hundred thousand with me, I file a UCC filing, which got, gives them like a secured interest against my company, but not a specific property. I see. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. And you've been doing that, you said, what, 12 years? Uh, since 06. Wow. So how did you start doing it in your Roth? So this was really interesting. I had an epiphany. So it was like 2012, 2013, I don't know, somewhere in there. And I was just so frustrated with how much taxes I was paying. Right. And so I Googled high net worth tax strategies at two in the morning. And the first 25 hits that came up were Mitt Romney. <laughs> But you didn't know that this conversation was going to Mitt Romney, <laughs> did you? So, and Mitt, you know, because he was running for president, he just he just released his tax returns, and you know, he was worth about two hundred and fifty million. Which, okay, that's fine, that's awesome. But one thing that when he submitted his his financials, he has he had ninety eight million dollars in his IRAs, and most people look at that and say, okay, that's cool, that's awesome. But people who understand, like your listeners, say, like, wait. How the hell do you get 98 million in an IRA? And, you know, it's kind of complicated what he did, but to make it simple, he just invested his IRA alongside his deals in his, in his uh, private equity deals. In a private equity deal, you might buy a company for a billion dollars. You put in a hundred million, you, you borrow 900 million. Five years later, you sell it for two billion. That's kind of the classic way it works. So, and you end up 10 times your money because you leverage yourself. So all of a sudden you put 250,000 from your IRA or your 401k in and you come out 2.5 million, you do it again, you come out 25 million. Maybe the next time you do it, you only make three times your money, you end up with 70, 80 million in your IRA without having to pay any taxes, at least until you pull the money out. And that's when the light bulb just, I was doing this all wrong in my head. I like my head hit the table my desk because I was lending out of my cash accounts and I had, you know, my retirement accounts were in like my mutual funds and stocks. And that's when I said, Oh my God, I have to change that. So that started a eight year process, which just fulfilled er, like last year where I was able to design a defined benefit plan, which is like a pension plan. We can talk more about that if you want, but it's a very unique type of plan that you can put up to a half a million, maybe even more than that, a year into it, tax deferred. And I did that. Now, there's there are downsides to that. You have to, you have to make enough money to do that. You have to do that for all your employees. So, it does it's not for everybody but i would but i created this plan to do that with help of financial advisors and accountants and special accountants and all that did that was able to put aside almost 2 million over the, over 5 years then then you know 6 years i think it was terminated the plan rolled the money into a ira and then converted it to a raw which is how I ended up with basically two, a total of 2.8 million in Roths. And it was painful. I mean, I wrote, I mean, I, I, I converted, you know, lat, over two years, one, almost 1 1.3 million in from IRA to Roth IRA and paid the taxes on that 1.3 million out of my pocket. Can't tell you how painful that was and how much I stressed over if that was the right decision or not. But finally, I say that, that, that the, the Death Star is like fully operational now because I've got this two and a half million that I'm lending out, making about 18% gross returns with not ever having to pay taxes ever again. And one of the things that I really discovered early in my life, my dad would kind of beat this over into my head, was the power of compound interest. So, you know, you've got 2.5 million that's earning 18% and you don't have to ever pay taxes again and it compounds at that rate. That's, that's the holy grail right there. So TJ, do you have an intermediary that facilitates all that? In terms of the IRA? Yes. 
So the money is in provident trust. I've also used equity trust in the past, but I don't like them as much or at all. Provident trust is much better because so provident. So I have a company, let's just call it company A and company A is funded by my IRA. And there's company B, which is funded by my wife's IRA. So the money goes into provident trust and then it was sent down to the LLC company A. And then I can just lend out of that company. But I can't take any money out of that company. I can't touch it. If you know, I'm not old enough to pull money out of the IRA yet, but if I wanted to, I'd have to send the money back up to the custodian and then take a distribution from that pers- from from the custodian. Yeah, totally. It was really important to do it that way because I was using equity trusts in the past, and they just couldn't. I couldn't fund my loans fast enough through them. I would. I wasn't getting good enough customer service, so I had to bring the lending down to the company level and then just have the IRA owns the company. So that's who actually owns company A is Provident Trust Group, FBO, uh, TJ's IRA. <laughs> that's the actual like owner of the company. Yeah, totally. And I'm just, I'm, just the, I'm just the manager. So when you started this whole process, did you have it very much in your Roth IRA at all at the time? No, like nothing. Like Less than 50 grand, less than 10 grand or? Uh, Probably when I started this in 2012, 2013, um, I'm just thinking out loud. I think I had had like nothing. I I had some IRA money from previous jobs and my wife had some 401k money from previous jobs. And as we were over time, we were able to convert that to the Ross and pay the taxes on it. And then when she left her when she retired and left her job, we rolled that money over into the Roth. We rolled it into a from her 403B into an IRA and then converted to the Roth and paid the taxes. And then we converted that pension money the same way. So after, sorry, just let me just jump in. So after it was all converted, what was the amount in your Roth? I guess the question is, what did you start with and what are you at now? I would say like 1.8, I'm just guessing like 1.8, like the, the major pension money just went into the Roth uh, last year in January, like one year ago. That's what I kind of mean is like the Death Star is fully operational for the first time. I've been planning this for eight years from 2013 because first I had to get the money into a 401k and then I have to, there's certain laws you have to follow on how many years you can have it in that, that pension plan or went into a pension plan. Then it got moved into the, the, the IRA and then converted to the Roth. So it's, it was like an eight to nine year plan that finally became fully operational last January. Interesting. So, I mean, it's a very unique strategy and one that the one that I don't know that we've had very many millionaires, you know, utilize on the show. As as you've gone about this process, how much money do you think you've saved in taxes by doing what you've done? Well, <laughs> I I don't know if I've saved any money in taxes yet because I paid all this money to put it into a Roth, right? I just wrote check after check to the government. Now, I'm starting to say now I'm starting to save the money because I don't have to pay the taxes on that money. Now I can't touch it yet either because I'm not old enough. Um, so I'm starting to really reap the benefits as of last year. But you know that does that assumes that Congress doesn't change the laws. I mean, there's there's lots of pitfalls in this. You know, that's it, it, I think it's really important. I, I'm a I'm a big believer in having different buckets. I mean, my my wealth advisors have like banged me over the head with that. So that's why, for example, you know, I still have 1.5 million in a 401k that I haven't converted to a Roth. Okay, just to keep it a little bit more balanced. Um, so because we don't know what the law, I mean, Congress changes the laws and they might make me take the money out. There's so many different things that could happen over the next 20, 30 years that it's just real important. It's important to me to keep things in different buckets, in a cash bucket, in a Roth bucket, in a normal IRA bucket, so that whatever the tax whatever happens with the tax laws going forward, I can kind of adjust and adjust to whatever happens. Yeah, totally. So is is that basically the, the strategy that as you've gone forward and built your wealth that you've tried to implement is, is really having some sort of diversified, you know, tax, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to call it tax location, but that's that's sometimes what the, the, the term that, that, that people refer to in the industry, but having diversified tax location, uh, you know, between your assets, is that really what you've tried to accomplish? 
Yeah. So diverse. So you want definitely diversified tax, what I call buckets. Okay. But then there's also diversified buckets. So I kind of try to keep one third of my assets in loans, one third of my assets in my other two companies and one third of my assets in the stock and, you know, the stock market through my financial guys. And it was tough to do that because I'm making such incredible returns on my loans and I've been doing it for so long. And I, you know, I went through 08 and 09. We can talk about that later where I lost a fair amount of money. Okay. During the housing crack crisis back then. But you, but even then you make so much money. It's like, why put any money in the stock market? And my financial advisor just kind of kept banging me on the head and say, we're going to get you where you want to go. You want to go straight up, you know, picture my hand going straight up in the air, like I'm climbing a really steep mountain. And they wanted me to climb more of a hill. The interesting thing is both the hill and the mountain get you to the same spot. Just the hill takes a little longer versus going straight up the mountain, right? So that they kind of, I acquiesced because I knew what they were saying was right, that it was important to be diversified. And so I started funneling money into the into the market to try to keep diversified, you know, so tax diversification and asset diversification has been a real important part of my strategy. Yeah. So the wealth advisors, the financial planners that you keep mentioning, how long have you used them? Since like 13, 13 or 14. I think beginning of 14. All right. Let's pause the show and thank Exter for sponsoring this week's episode. At Exter, their mission is simple. They're in business to make people's daily lives easier. First, they reimagine the traditional wallet, making it easier to use and harder to lose. To them, innovation means bringing together the luxury of classic leather goods and the invention of slim technologies to create a wallet that's the best of both worlds. So what makes Exter different? Well, they've created a super slim wallet with a sleek and minimalistic design half the size of a conventional bifold wallet. Their quick and easy card access, environmental friendly and high quality materials, and they even include a solar powered tracking device that lets you track the wallet's location from a smartphone if you're one that loses the wallet often. So they sent Jason and I some of these wallets and they are cool. My wife and I were fighting over who got to keep it because you shake this thing and the cards just don't fall out and there was an easy clip to get the money out. So it was really, really cool. So get up to 20% off by using code MILLIONAIRE for the summer sale at shop.exter.com forward slash millionaire. Again, that's shop.exter, E-K-S-T-E-R dot com forward slash millionaire for up to 20% off. And thanks to Exter for sponsoring this week's episode. So you, three different businesses here we, we talk about, right? Two environmental companies and then the lending company, which is yep. how do you decide how to balance resources, whether that's time or money between the businesses? That's a great question. Um, I So one, so, so the one thing that the three businesses have in common is they use the same client base. So the same clients that would use the different business, the same clients that use the environmental companies, you know, investors are the same clients that I can then quote, sell them hard money and vice versa. So that's the neat thing. And then I actually structured the companies to be completely opposite of each other. So, you know, one one of my environmental companies, it's a service company. It's government regulated. It, it doesn't take any capital to run, but I've got employees and all the, you know, downsides of having employees, you know, and, and um, the, but it's recession proof because it's government regulated and dictated. The, the hard money business is, um, takes a lot of capital. I have almost no employees in that. It's not government regulated, but in a recession, I can, you know, it can, times can get tough or I can lose. So I wanted to structure them in a way that if one of the businesses was struggling or, or it went out of business for whatever reason, within 18 months, I could increase the other business to make up for the business that went under. And that was really how I was designed. And so I kind of want to keep them even. Now the lending business is kind of skyrocketing and going above the other two, but I'm okay with that. So I've really taken on you know, I know it's probably at some point you're going to ask me, you know, what some of the things that made a difference in how I looked at things. And one of the things that did was Kiyosaki's uh, Cash Flow Quadrant, that book. And I really, I really saw the vision of having a business as opposed to a, being a highly compensated self employed person and really took on in, in like about eight, 17 or 18 to 
get people to to train, enroll, and register people and train them in running my business. So I now have like a general manager for one environmental company. I have a general manager for the other environmental company. And now I'm working on creating a plan to have somebody run the lending company so that I could do what I want to do and have these companies generate money and cash flow while I can travel the world, you know, whatever I want to do. I don't even know yet, but that's that's the plan. I've been working hard to fulfill on that. So what do you spend your time doing now? I, you know, I'm, a, I love business. I, I'm one of the things I'm, if you inside, are you guys familiar with the cash flow quadrant? Yeah. 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 So I'm really, you know, into um, looking at investments now, you know, buying companies that, that will somehow create synergy with my existing company. So I'm in, you know, basically the real estate business. So it's like, what other real estate service businesses can I buy that would facilitate, that would make, that could A, generate cash and B, create some synergy where one plus one equals three or one plus one plus one plus one equals six type of a thing. So that's what I, I'm doing. I still run the other companies. I spend maybe an hour a day on, the two environmental companies, and then I spend, um, you know, two, you know, many three or four or five hours a day on the on the lending business because I don't have anybody running that company for me. Yeah, so you really switched industries here, right, TJ? I mean, you went from the environmental, or excuse me, from the restaurant businesses now to environmental businesses and the hard money <laughs> l- lending. So just let's take, or not the hard money, but whatever the lending. Take that out of it. You went from restaurants to environmental. How did that switch even happen? So, um, so I learned a lot of very good lessons in the restaurant industry. Like one, don't be in the restaurant industry. So when I, I owned it, you know, I was a, a corporate executive for, you know, several years. And then I, I opened up my own restaurants with another part, with a couple of partners. Five years later, we were out of business and um, I had personal guarantees on those loans, ended up declaring bankruptcy. And that was back in like 2004. So I learned an incredible amount of lessons in that in terms of, you know, I'm a big, big, huge believer in high margin businesses. All three of my businesses now are incredibly high margin. We cash flow maybe about almost 40% to the bottom line across all three companies. And, you know, if you're in the restaurant business and you cash flowed 8%, that was awesome. Okay. So what happened as the businesses were failing and we knew that it wasn't going to last long, there, there was these guys that would come in every, you know, every Friday for lunch. I became friends with them. And then they sat down and they said, why don't you do this envir- environmental work for us, which, which, you know, was needed, was required by law. And I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever, I'll, I'll do it. Cause it was kind of a big contract. They own 600 properties, right? Started that. And that, you know, went from that, and now we have all, over twelve thousand clients in those two businesses. Probably more like fourteen thousand if you add the two together. So um, it just took off, and you know, fi- it was it just, just you know, just committed to run it better than anybody else would, and that was the key to my success in starting with that. Hmm. Jumping back to your your lending, sorry, I'm just thinking of questions as we yeah. keep talking. How many of your loans, how many total loans have you made? If I mean, ballpark number, I'm sure you don't know to the to the loan, but how many of them have gone bad? Yeah, so we, I, I funded over 1,100 over the last, and I've, I counted just recently, so it's probably somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 now. Well, so the interesting thing is when you lend hard money, you're lending money on, you know, you're lending money usually at between 60 and 70% of the value of the property. So a loan going bad is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it, it's not good, okay? But it doesn't mean you're going to lose money either. So if the question is how many, how often have I lost money, that would be I very rarely lose money, and I lost on every single loan that I did in 06, 07, 08, when the mark, whatever I had in my portfolio, almost every loan lost money at that point in 08, 09. That was like an unbelievably tough time. Since then, you know, I've probably funded four or 500 loans and I maybe lost money. I lost less than five grand and maybe five or six of them and lost some serious, I lost one loan, I lost 200,000 on. And, and, Really, that's about it. You know, I lost maybe a couple of hours. I lost 10 or 15 and that's it. What, what's the 200 one? What's the story there? Well, you know, so when we, we did a loan, so I, I when you lo- to lose $200,000 on a $300,000 loan takes an incredible amount of skill. 
I just want you to know that. Like, <laughs> I mean, you, it's like you really have to try to do it. <laughs> you have to screw up so many things at the same time, right? So one is we were putting a he was putting an addition on the property, and um, I overvalued the addition. So there was just an interesting dynamic where I thought if you put a in this twenty five thirty thousand dollar addition on it, it would add fifty thousand. And he put a $25,000 addition on and it added nothing because people could then go to a different neighborhood, you know, a mile away and get for the same amount of money and get a a bigger yard. Mistake number one. Mistake number Mm -hmm. two is somehow he got through my process without pulling permits. And, and that, I mean, that's on him, but it's on me for not for paying out construction draws without confirming that he pulled the permits and got the inspections done. So that created a huge problem. And then the ultimate unbelievable problem was he budgeted about $8,000 for a retaining wall that when we got the bid on it to actually do it was $150,000 on a retaining wall. I mean, I am I have a PhD in retaining walls now, okay? And it was just an incredible – I can't even – I mean, I spent $20,000 to remove trees just so they could get back – to do the retaining wall. And then you would have to, you know, you have to, as high, it was going to be a 14 foot high wall to stop the, the hill from collapse, from coming down during the, with the erosion onto the new addition. See, if there was no new addition, you wouldn't need the wall. But the, the addition brought the house far closer to that hill. Then you needed, and then it was a 14 foot high wall that then needed a 14 foot he- footer like a big giant, like a cement L. Then they pile the, all the dirt on that footer and it holds the wall up. So you had to, and then, so then you have to, you have to build like a temporary wall so that you don't, you know, kill the people as they are, they're digging the wall. You know what I mean? Like you see those temporary walls when they're doing sewers. It, it was just unbelievable. Long story short, $300,000 loan. I lost 200000 all because of like six different mistakes I made at the same time. What was the value of the house? I'm just curious. Well, I thought it was 440, and it ten- only turned out to be 375, which was that mistake I made in the appraisal. Interesting. But yep. Yep. So I made a 300 thousand dollar loan, thinking he could sell it for 440, and then he only sold it. Then, then I had to put another 150 thousand more into it than I thought. Got less than I thought, and went three years without interest. So if you include the interest. I've lost like about 330000 Jeez. So, TJ, you've built up these businesses. You've got a great net worth. You've got the the three buckets that, that you described earlier. Where do you go from here? Are you targeting a net worth? Or are you trying to get to a certain point in your financial journey? Yeah. So, um, I'm 54. I, I turned 60, obviously, in six years. It, 60 is not a significant number to me in itself, but it's when my last – kid goes to college. So that kind of allows me to free up, to travel, to do different things. Um, my intention, and I have a plan and I'm on track for that, would be to have about $25 million by age 60, which allows me, you know, using the 4% rule would allow me to live off of a million a year. And, you know, I'll probably go way higher than that, but that just gives me the ability to do whatever the heck I want with almost no, you know, no, no restrictions. Totally. Are you primarily going to build that through through your lending businesses and, and your service businesses? And any other investments that I might make. And what that allows – so for me, you know, one of the questions people might have or question I would have if I was listening would be why is why is why why am I on this web – why am I on this podcast? And one of my – I have a huge commitment to people creating and causing FI in their life, you know, financial independence. So if my story can motivate or make a difference or you can learn lessons or learn what to avoid by listening, that, that's huge for me. I take on, I mentor other people in, in coaching them around finances. I coach other people, n- not for money, just like, you know, just I, t- I take people underneath my wing. And um, this I, I saw this podcast when you guys approached me as an opportunity to make a difference with tens of thousands of, of people and not just the few that I – uh, that I'm mentoring. Yeah, totally. So I and we definitely to, I look forward to doing that more and more in the future. Yeah, totally. And we definitely appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story. Does your peers or family know you're wealthy or 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 know of of the success that you've had so far? I, they probably will now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I think they know money is important to me and they know that I have a, a, a substantial amount of wealth. I think they'd be pretty stunned at the actual number. Have you changed your, your peer group as you've gained more and more wealth and, and, and you know, had more success in business and in your personal financial life? Yeah, I, I, one of my huge um, – I've always – you know, believe that you're kind of the sum of the five people you hang around most, whatever that 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 saying is. And I've always tried to to hang out and to be around people that are wealthier than me. And so I hang out with a lot of the lenders in my area that we all have the same problems, you know, lending. We, we have a little association where we all kind of meet once a month for dinner. There's about 15 of us. And we've, I've become friends with those people, hang out with them, sometimes go on vacation with them. So I definitely veer towards those those types of people and still try to keep my connections with the people that don't have that type of, in, of net worth. So it wouldn't be uncommon for us to go rent a huge Airbnb house and just invite some invite a family or two to join us on vacation, that kind of thing. So TJ, when if someone were to ask you, hey, you know, you have a net worth of $10 million. You want to get to 25. When is enough enough? What would you say? Or why, why keep going? What's what's motivating you to keep it going? Well, so a couple, um, a couple of things. So one is I really enjoy it. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons I really struggle with the FIRE movement. You know, it's like financially independent, retire early, because most people when they're in that movement are retiring from something as opposed to retiring to something. If you ask me what would be my ideal perfect job, I would say be a shark on Shark Tank. And I just love like hearing people's pitches, reading business plans, investing in other companies. So I see myself moving more and more towards that. What whatever the net worth is, it is. I kind of set the 25 million not so much because because it generated that million dollars a year and it coincided with when I turn when my last kid goes to college. So I have no desire to be a billionaire. I have no desire to like have a hundred million. I might end up there, but I have no desire for that. So I kind of set my mark at that 25. While a lot of people might set it at two or three or seven or eight or whatever. I just chose that from nothing. And then I've, you know, created and fulfilled on that. And I, I think it gives me a tremendous, I'm, I'm really designing this the next half of my life right now in terms of you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to start a foundation? How do, how do I make, I feel I have this like innate skill to make money. So how can I use that to make a difference in the world? And I'm really in that inquiry now of how to go about doing that. So what are your thoughts then on generational wealth? Do you plan to leave some of this to your family? I, I don't know. My kids are young, you know, they're both in one's in middle school and one's in high school. I'm struggling with that conversation in my head. I really am. And um, I don't feel the need to. I, I, and I can easily see donating a majority of it and leaving them a, a little, whatever a little bit it is 30 years from now. I don't know what that is. I think Warren Buffett said it best where I want to leave them enough where they, where they, they what, what was his phrase? I, I want to leave them enough where they can't, they can't do nothing, but can do anything, yep. something like that. So I don't know what that is, but I, I love that philosophy. Yeah. So do you ever think about selling your businesses and doing something else, starting a new business, investing in other businesses? Well, I'm actually selling the two businesses as we speak. I sell them to my employees. So in one business, my employees have bought a 7% uh, or 8.5% stake now, and they're they're increasing that every every year. And in the other business, my employees own, you know, own 50% of it. You know, I, I said, you know, the, the environmental company number two is only worth like half a million. Be, it's really worth a million. Just my share is only worth a half a million because I only own 50 percent of it. So my in a perfect world, I would sell it to them or in a and I'm fine with just turning it over to them completely, you know, you know, eight years from now or something or in a best case. I don't know if it's a best case scenario. One scenario is they they own 50 percent of it. I own 50 percent and they run it. And I just I get my my dividends every month. Yeah. And and they and they're you know it's it's important to me that everybody win, that I win, my employees win, my customers win, my investors win. That's kind of how I, how I define success. So I want my employees to be able to walk away from a career with this and having built wealth for themselves and have won that game. Sure. Sure. 
So are you, as you've built these companies, I assume you've spent a lot of time doing it and in the process you've given up some things. Has, has that been worth it or how have you been able to manage a work-life balance or what's your take and advice there? Well, I, I have a great work-life balance now. It wasn't always that way. And I, you know, my, one of my businesses doubled overnight, like literally from Friday to Monday, it doubled because the regulations changed. The government changed the laws, which doubled the business. And it was awesome. I knew it was coming. It happened. We were just cranking, you know, I hit, I told everybody I hit the lottery and I'm milking it for all it's worth. And I did that for, you know, I don't know, eight months. Then we went on vac- you, at that point when I go on vacation, I would work, I'd get up maybe six, seven o'clock, go out to the pool, go, go to the beach, work, answer emails, return voicemails for three hours, then shut down and be with the family. I got to the resort, turned my phone on, got the internet up and running and looked at my emails and everything and said, oh my God, did I screw up? And I turned to my wife. I go, I just so screwed up. She goes, what do you mean? Well, because what we, where I was spending three hours a day now just became six because my business doubled. And I didn't factor that in and proceeded to ruin the entire vacation for my wife and the kids. <laughs> that, that wasn't that wasn't a great moment, but I learned a very important lesson and I made a prom and I really got that my life in that level, my life lacked integrity in that it wasn't workable. OK, and I, I made a promise to my wife that the next vacation I'd have somebody trained to run the business while I went on vacation. And that was the start of that. And then it, that was really reinforced when I read the cash flow quadrant. And then I've really been on a mission to turn over the, the running of the businesses to the other people, which is really fits in what I want to do. Because I don't want to manage the nitty gritty. I want to spend maybe an hour at the most on the phone a day with each person kind of creating what we're going to do, the you know initiatives we have, let them let them do the nitty gritty. They can answer the phones and deal with the employee problems and the client problems and all that. And I'm more of a strategic thinker and making sure we're in, headed in the right direction as a company. And then slowly turning that then over to them, or maybe I'm just talking once a week for an hour, once a month for an hour, something like that. That would be my plan. Yeah. So when did you feel like you could do that? Whether it's being able to afford it or being able to take a step back and let somebody operate and run it to, to a, that full extent? About so the question is when was I able to do that? About a year and a half ago, it kind of fell into everything started to fall into place. And now I just keep giving more and more away to the different people. You know, I just had my general manager now. He he sat in on the employee reviews, which he had never done before. So I'm going to slowly turn that over to him. Maybe next year, he'll he'll sit in on them this year with me. I'll I'll model them. He'll observe. Then in the second half of the year, he'll do them. I'll observe, and then he'll just do them going forward. Maybe in 2021 or 2022. So I just keep turning things over to them, which means less and less for me. Except I still have that pesky lending business, which I still run myself, which I need to cause a transformation in, so that I I have somebody else that can do that. Yeah. Do you get burnout? No, I love it. To me, it's like. You gotta, you gotta love, you gotta love what you do. And if you don't love what you do, you gotta find something that you love or transform whatever you, who, whatever position you're in. If you're in a corporate job working for the man or whatever, you, you gotta transform who you're being to take on loving what you do because you're the only one that's suffering if you're not. You talk to your kids about money. I do. How do you teach them? I teach them the po- I've, t- I've taught them compound interest. I give my kids and my employees. Um, the opportunity to earn a 14% guaranteed return in my lending company. So I want I do want to address that with you because I think you might have some questions about the employees on that side of that. But so the kids put about 50% of what they make into the lending company where they get a 14% return, which is kind of like I don't make any money on them. It's kind of like my net profit. You know, I gross 18%. I got about 4% of expenses and net, you know, 14, 15%. So they and then I use that to show them over time what the power of compound interest is. And my daughter's really understood that. You know, she she's 15. My son's um, 13. He's not quite there. Yeah, I haven't had those conversations with them yet, but they're coming. Got it. Got it. So as the net worth and the incomes continue to grow, TJ, has it increased your happiness, confidence levels? Does it have, have any effect emotionally at all in your life? Yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't. 
<laughs> you know, I don't think it should, but I think it absolutely does. It gives you confidence that especially somebody like myself, who's a big fan of a fi and stands for it and, and, and causes it and commits other to other people getting there. It gives me confidence that what I'm teaching is the, or what I'm standing for is the correct thing. Having the financial freedom to kind of do anything, anytime, any place is a tremendous feeling. I mean, I can't, I can't say enough about how awesome that is. Now you can create, you know, I'm a big believer in freedom and I look at like money creates freedom for me and you can create freedom without money. It's just a lot more fun with the money. That's what I would say. <laughs> so let's jump into some rapid fire questions here and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, how much do you spend annually? Uh, not including taxes. Correct. Yeah, just yeah, About household almost, expenses. Almost exactly 300. Okay. You've been your range of income through your working life. So since your first job till till now. I started at 22,000 out of college in 1988-ish. And depending on how you look, you know, it's always complicated when you own your own businesses because you have different ways of paying the owner. But anywhere now, I can be anywhere from 1.3 to, to 2 million. Awesome. Good for you. Uh, how old were you when you became a millionaire? 40. 10 years past what my goal was. All right. So let's say you became a millionaire at 40. How long until you hit 5 million? Um, I could tell you exactly. I have this all tracked. So I was. Um, 5 million right at age 49. So 40 to 49. And then what about to, to where you're at now? I'm asking your age, basically. 50, yeah, I'm 54. So, and so, uh, another five years and, um, that's where I'm at now. Gotcha. Okay. Um, financial advisor, we talked about that. How much do you spend a year? Favorite books? You mentioned Cashflow Quadrant. Any others? Uh, I really like the um, the richest man in Babylon. Of course, I'm a lender, and that's what kind of that's about. <laughs> so it's it's a incredible book to teach the power of compound interest. Yeah, what's the most expensive car you've ever purchased? I just um, well, if you include a lease, I just leased the last year a BMW X4M. Chase is a car person. He'll have to chime in with how much that is. I have no uh, idea. Just on a lease. It's a, well, I mean, if you were going to buy it, it I think uh, list price, it's 85 Okay. Uh, what about the most expensive meal that you've personally paid for? Um, in terms of like for one, you know, for two people? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Or if you took a company out? Well, if you take a, if you, I mean, if I, I when I take my, my employees out, that runs about 7000 unfortunately. <laughs> they, <laughs> they like to it to me. I'm, I'm like budgeting, you know, one or two drinks per person and like eight drinks later at $15 a drink, I got a $7,000 bill, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Good for you though, man. That's awesome. So DJ, just in closing gear, I mean, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being so open and sharing everything. What would be your advice to somebody who's just starting out? You know, maybe they're fresh out of college or maybe they're at the beginning stages of your career. If someone were to ask you, what's your advice? How are you able to do this? You have a net worth of almost $10 million. What would you say? Well, so I'm going to answer your question with four components. So one, the first thing you should do is go do the Landmark Forum. So I've been, I've taken a lot of courses at Landmark Worldwide, and I really attribute a lot of that their their courses, it's not about money. It's about transformation and about eliminating the obstacles that are in front of you and how you have these hidden, you know, things that hold you back from what you're committed to in life. And I've really used the distinctions and what I've gotten out of those courses to really just exponentially leapfrog my life and not have things hold me back, whether it be money, relationships, everything. So that would be number one. Number two is I would say to understand the 4% rule. Okay. So that, that people understand that what, you know, people say, I want 10 million. Well, I don't, see, I, I don't look at 25 million. I look at that's a million dollars a year I can spend. So whatever you're, you want to transfer, translate your net worth into cash flow, because that's what you can understand and get related to. So if you understand the 4% rule, that will alter how you start looking at your finances over the next 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Three, un really understand and get the power of compound interest. It's just incredible. I think I read that Warren Buffett um, started with 100000 in his mid-20s and made 23% a year average for 65 years. 
So, I mean, that's how simple it is. I know how, I know that's not replicatable, but all you have to do is start with a hundred thousand and make 23%. You'll be, you'll be worth a hundred billion. So people really understanding the power of compound interest and really understanding that if you, a, a dollar saved today, if you're in your early, if you're 20 years old is equivalent to $90 late at, at age 65. It's not a one to one ratio. So I would say understand the power of compound interest. That would be number three. And number four would be to just put away 20, at a minimum 20% and, and more like 25% from day one in your job. If you put if you put aside 25%, I mean, you, you just kind of heard what I did. I mean, I get it's easier for me to do because I make so much money, but I'm putting away 65% of what I make. I'm not driving a Ferrari. I don't. I live in a seven hundred thousand dollar home, which I know it sounds expensive, but it's. I can afford a three million dollar home, but I'm not buying one. You know, like if the more money you can save, the better you'll be able to generate well. So if you're looking for a rule of thumb, is just put twenty five percent of your money aside from day one, and you'll be and you'll have millions by the time you're retired. That's what I would say. Awesome, awesome, and thanks for sharing. I know you set up an email. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they reach you? They can reach me at TJ Unverified. Uh, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Unverified. <laughs> T, TJ. You kind of you are unverified, Joe. <laughs> we, we verify millionaires. <laughs> Don't get the wrong picture. T, TJ is verified. <laughs> T, T, TJ Unveiled at gmail.com. All right. TJ Unveiled at gmail.com. All right, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Really fun interview. Interesting. Thanks for opening up. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the honor. Thanks for listening to the Millionaire's Unveiled podcast with Clark Sheffield and Chase Mantinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website at millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.